several weeks ago, we went shopping at the nearest outlet mall. For a person who hates to shop, it was overwhelming. I was flooded with sights, sounds, and people coming from every direction. I only tolerated a couple of hours of it, and then I had to head home. I had to call it a day. Are you or someone you know like this? Do you find that you get recharged by spending some time to yourself? Or do you find that you feel energized by being with people? For me, I can easily say I'm an introvert. I don't like surfacey interactions. I like to go deep or go home. That's why when I'm among a large group of people, it better be a play or a musical that I can study or otherwise I shut off. It's taken me time to have self-awareness about my introversion and how it affects my relationship with people. I've learned that introversion is not a bad thing. In fact, it can be seen as a gift if we let it. Hello and welcome to Relationship Helpers. This is your host, Vincent Ketchy, and I have with me today writer, personal, and relationship coach, Brenda Knowles. She is the author of the book, The Quiet Rise of Introverts, Eight Practices for Living and Loving in a Noisy World. Thank you for being with us here today, Brenda. Good to be here. Thank you. So uh, share with our audience a little bit more about yourself and your background and your expertise. Okay. As you said, I wrote The Quiet Rise of Introverts, and for the last six years, almost seven, I've been writing and researching introversion and high sensitivity and applying it on my website, brendanoles.com. I have a deep interest in relationships, particularly relationships that introverts or highly sensitive people have um, with their family members, with their partners. Um, I've done, I worked as what we call here in Minnesota, a guardian ad litem, which is someone or sometimes they're called a CASA worker. And I work with, I worked with kids who were removed from their homes due to neglect or abuse, and then I advocated for them in the courtroom. And I would meet with the kids, their parents, their foster parents, their teachers, their therapists, and then make the best recommendation for where the children should be placed. So when I did that for years, I learned a lot about um, attachment theory, about family dynamics, uh, relationships, and that kind of piqued my interest in in people and what's going on inside and in between people. Um, And then I realized myself uh, that I am more introverted and pretty highly sensitive. Um, And I wanted to learn more about that. And I was married, had three children, working with those relationships and having some challenges, having some struggles. And so I do what I do, and that's like learning. You know, I, I dig in and try to figure out, okay, how can I make this better? Where where are we falling short? What's going on? And so through that kind of research for my personal interests, as well as my work as a guardian ad litem, as well as training I did later as um, a family mediator, which kind of is um, an alternative to using a lawyer when you're going through divorce proceedings. All of that kind of taught me a lot about collaboration, a lot about connection, um, different relationship dynamics and how to enhance them, improve them, make life more comfortable, more safe, more connected for everyone. So I have just a lot of trailing interest and, and all those things. And then i started putting it all into writing on my website. And I have a blog that's titled Space to Live, and that is where I really dug into the introversion, highly sensitive thing, and um, kind of focused on letting people know what introversion is and how introverts interact with others and why and how they can work best with other people. So you worked a lot with the court system and you worked a lot with children and saw lots of very bad situations. Yeah, that right. As a guardian, there obviously those are kind of the worst of the worst some cases. What I 
found, and even when I interviewed for that um, role, the interviewer told me, you're going to see these parents on paper and they're going to seem like monsters, but when you meet them, they're going to seem like Like yourself or someone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) So, and, and that was true. And I found that I liked working with the parents as much as I liked working with the children or, you know, advocating for both, trying to obviously in the end goal, making everyone more secure, you know, happier and better you know, together or apart, or whatever the you know case may be. But it was I've kind of worked with both, and I have my own relationships and my own children. And I was married. I am now divorced, but in a, a long term relationship, and um, just learned a lot, you know, basically through personal experience, but also through professional work. And now I do coaching as well for others. So I work with introverts. I work with their partners. I work with families. Um, yeah. So you, uh, as you worked with these families, you really had a heart for these families, helping these families. And once okay. you started doing that, you started thinking more about yourself. It sounds like and doing a lot more uh, deeper thoughts, I guess, on your relationships. Right. And I, I will say, even before I worked as a guardian ad litem, I was focusing on my own family and, and those interests and learning about those too. I guess it all, it's interesting how things come together and what you learn, you know, how things become applicable in your own life as well as at work or whatever. And um, I think personally, I'm, I'm very drawn to those types of call. I don't know. Those are my calling, I guess, to, to help people or to, to figure people out or get understanding. And I sort of really have an interest in people's internal worlds. So understanding those and then having them work with others, you know. Yeah, so you like to get beyond the surface of some. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a, a, you know, a typical or a stereotypical introvert trait, you know, to be very, you know, internally focused on yourselves, but also on others. That's why a lot of times introverts will say, oh, we hate small talk. We really don't want to just chit-chat with the cashier at the store or, you know, because a real interest is in what's, what's underneath there, you know, what's, what's going on in that, with that person inside, <laughs> you know, like what else is there going on? So yeah, I just have always had um, a keen interest, even not in a selfish, um, you know, self-obsessed way, but just, you know, kind of analyzing my own thoughts and my own ideas and then being curious about others, being open to others, um, internal well-being, internal thoughts and ideas too. And then just helping people mesh together, like when we are in relationships, because that is kind of hard meshing those two different worlds based on you know, our own innate temperament and what we've learned over the years through different relationships and how we've been shaped. So tell me about introversion, the difference between an introvert and an extrovert. For me and what I've learned in all my research, the the biggest differences are where we get our energy, how we recharge. Um, Introverts find more energy from within um, or for being or having time downtime to ourselves, either in solitude or with one or two very close people that we have, you know, innate, you know, real trust with and a safety with and can relax with, where extroverts tend to get hits of energy from being with other people, you know, just interacting, you know, more often and stuff. So that's one of the big differences. And then also introverts do have a a biological difference in the way they process stimulation from the external world. Um, Even taking in information, a lot of times introverts put things into long-term memory, like, you know, more so than keeping it in short-term memory and and recalling super quickly, which is why a lot of times introverts will not like being called on, you know, spontaneously in class or having to have an answer super quickly because it takes a while to recall that information because we're pulling it from way far back, but it's, it's how we take in stimulation is the, the main point of 
that where extroverts just don't process as deeply, don't take in as much. It's, you know, it's not like a fire hose coming in as much right. <laughs> where with the introvert, just everything is, is coming in and we're more easily overstimulated. And that's, they've done lots of studies from infancy. You know, there's just some people who are more sensitive to that and react stronger and therefore often need a little more time away from even things such as, you know, bright lights and loud sounds and um, other people. You know, people can be pretty stimulating too. So the introverts have to kind of access that information in the deeper parts of their brain many times. And, and it takes what I'm hearing time and maybe solitude to really do yeah. that well. But extroverts yeah, are able to just kind of talk about it out loud and jump from maybe one subject to the next or just kind of... Right, and they actually process as they're talking. You know, like for a lot of times for extroverts, and my daughter is an extrovert, she will talk okay. <laughs> as she's thinking and processing things. And that, to my sons who are more introverted, <laughs> to them, that could be annoying, you know, sometimes because there's... Why are you talking so much? You just because they're processing internally, and she is she has to do it externally. I mean that she actually has to hear it out in the world, you know, to to confirm it in her mind. So it's it's interesting, but knowing that it helps me help them, you know, not get too annoyed with each other or too. <laughs> just you know, it just helps them understand. I guess. Right? Yeah. So you don't get so they're frustrated. All teenage, yeah. They're teenagers and they still don't always listen to what I say <laughs> or, you know, take that into uh, consideration. But they, I hope, it, I'm hoping I'm planting seeds that <laughs> later really come to fruition. So, so what would you uh, tell our listeners if they have, say, an introvert as a child? What, what would you tell them how to communicate with them? What would help? What are some skills they could use? Well, definitely... Um, make them feel safe in being themselves. I, I've seen a lot of parents push their kids to be more extroverted. You know, oh, well, Johnny really needs some more socializing, you know, so I'm going to put him in this group, in this team, and I want him to be in this class, and I want him to be in school all day, even though he's four. Being in tune with your child and what they need as far as, you know, your child might need more time to themselves. They might need time in their room. They might need reading time to really feel um, at home or at, at ease. If you're constantly assuming that they need more interaction to be louder, to be more outgoing, that's essentially telling them they're not right. There's something wrong with them. You know, they're not living up to your expectations, which is pretty tough thing to digest, you know, as a child and, and it gets those stay with you, you know, those feelings of falling short. I grew up with a very extroverted sister myself who was the squeaky wheel. You know, she wanted something, she made it known, and that's great, but I was the opposite. I was, okay, I'm fine, I'll take care of myself. I'll just go in my room and read or play with my dolls or you know whatever I did when I was young which was fine and I was fine in my room and doing things but I always felt like I it wasn't as good as what my sister was doing it you know it wasn't as positive um like I should be more funny and cute and talkative and I should be you know out with everybody I should be outside with my dad and hanging out and you know, doing things but I wasn't comfortable doing that. And it sort of became my sister's role, and I had mine. And for years, we were like sort of on opposite teams, she and I, which was not good. It would have been way better to be on the same team. Um, but I think if we would have had both of our traits admired or um, encouraged, then I think it would have been easier for us to be friends and collaborative and, and better it just was sort of like we everyone pointed out our differences and that was uh, tough anyway I, as a parent i say encourage listen to your child right. really be in tune with what they need now i will say children do need to be um push their boundaries a little you know not 
don't let them be a hermit their whole childhood. You know, they, they do need to have relationships and know how to connect with others and because that's vital to the well being, you know, in, in the long run. Mm -hmm. So definitely get them out and, and interact with them and, and let them have friends and, you know, encourage them to have friends and things, but just don't, don't push or give them the message that they're not adequate. <laughs> even years later, my parents told me, well, we just, even when I was a teenager and, and a college student, they said, well, we just thought you were okay. So we just focused on, you know, the other kids or whatever, which can happen when you're quiet, you know, when someone isn't the one who's always speaking up or who is more internally focused or then, yeah, people assume, oh, well, they're fine. We don't have to worry about them. The thing I've been working on a lot for the last few years is working on calming each other's nervous systems. And that can be between adults or in between family members, parents and children, but just really making the other person feel safe and calm. And for introverts, that's a big deal because our nervous systems are kind of amped up anyway. You know, we, we pick up all, like I said, all that stimulation really quickly. So someone who's soothing and comforting and makes us feel um, heard or understood or listened to is going to really help us blossom, help us be more open, be more talkative, outgoing, whatever. I mean, that's, yeah. So for parents and children or two adults, make that other person feel comfortable, like soothed and like you're open to them. That's key. I read a book probably, and this is as an adult, like, um, about 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago, called If You Want to Write, a book of, I think it's a book of art and independence or something like that. <laughs> this is the subtitle. But um, it's by Brenda Euland, who was um, an author here in Minneapolis, where I live. Um, but she said, everyone is interesting. And she said, if you are honest and tell true details about yourself, people will find you interesting. But she also said that interested people are interesting. So if you listen to others and you ask questions and others, it's kind of funny, but others find you interesting that <laughs> they really are drawn to you. Um, they feel seen and heard in your presence. So one thing that the key phrase that I remember from this was she said, listening is love. So, you know, as I've done lots of other reading and research and, and things, you know, I, I see it as, okay, this is being present with someone essentially like very open to someone and, and listening keenly to what they say and not just planning what you want to say. But um, anyway, the big thing I, I learned was that, okay, I don't have to be super gregarious or funny or entertaining. I can be a good listener and be valued and be important at the same time, making someone else feel valued and important. And that it just... Like I said, I think I always felt like I had to be funny and entertaining and possibly, and a lot of that I'm sure stems from my childhood and, and watching my sister be funny and entertaining and get attention. But um, I learned there's a different way to be valued. And for introverts who are very good listeners in general, not everyone, of course, but, um, and for someone who processes other people's internal worlds pretty deeply, that's like, okay, there's, there's value in that. That's cool. It's just that connection that you can get. But it, it also, I mean, I guess for me, a lot of it was, it gave me personal value too. I felt like, oh, okay, I'm good at that. I'm good at listening. I'm good at, you know, hearing other people and taking it in. And so I started to use that 
more too. I started to use it in my writing, in my work with the guardian kids and, and then eventually when coaching and what I do now. So being in tune with others is a skill, is a valued skill, a valued trait even, you know, that someone has. So Okay. And do you have any advice for our listeners who might be in a relationship with an introvert? So as I said earlier, I, I feel like learning how to calm each other calm each other's nervous systems in a relationship is very key. Um, and a couple ways to do that is, well, being responsive and reassuring. So when I say responsive, I mean, to even little things, say your partner says, Oh, look, the neighbor's got a new mailbox or, you know, something, you know, inane like that. And actually turning towards your partner and looking out the window and saying, oh, yeah, they did. And, you know, even though it's like a dumb little topic, it's just showing your person, okay, I heard you and, and I'm with you. And there you go. So same, like the responsiveness, reassurance, kind of in the same vein, but but just important. Um in the relationship that I'm in now, one of the best things that my partner does is he he reassures me constantly, not in a patronizing, I need him constantly to be telling me he loves me, or but just I'll text him, he texts back, you know, relatively quickly if he can. Um, he's positive and optimistic and open and just... I never have mixed signals. You know, I don't wonder, oh, okay, does he want to get together this weekend? Or, you know, does he, it, he's just open and there. And I know, you know, he's committed to us, to our families and, and those kind of things. But it's, it makes me at ease. It lets me relax and then I can be receptive and open too. Where I've had um, my ex-husband and other long-term relationships where it wasn't that reassuring. There was always, um, there's distancing or things that I just left me wondering a lot. Like, okay, is this, is this good? Is this secure? Are we okay? And um, I, yeah, that didn't work. I guess a lot of it is just not going into autopilot, not being distracted by the million other things that we could all be distracted by. I mean, obviously life is busy and we all have, you know, big to-do lists and things, but really, yeah, I guess intentional is a great word, focusing and being there, like really being present and taking that time to make eye contact with your person you know that's important it doesn't happen as much we tend to get you know we're on our phones or on our laptops we are watching tv we're reading you know we're doing other things even with the kids and and everything so it's it's tough but to really look at each other and touch you know hold hands sit close to each other get all those senses involved too so you can even smell each other, you know, all those things like be that present with someone as much as possible. It's not going to be every day, all day. You can't, you know, but make it an important thing. So, right. And so what you're saying is that it's easy to get distracted these days right. with so many things right. like technology and not give the full attention to your partner. Right. Right. Cause it's so easy to get distracted anymore and just, you know, a million things can call at you and pull at you. And it, that's why I think a lot of people get disconnected and, and don't feel like their person is in tune with them because it really is about getting past those surface things and being in tune with what's underneath, what's going on inside that person. And when someone feels felt or feels understood in a deeper level, that lets everybody relax and become more receptive and open 
when we're all just distracted all the time and, and working on goals or, you know, things that aren't the relationship, it's, it just puts people apart. Even parent-child, we need to feel seen and heard. And it's tough these days sometimes. So we're coming to the end of our interview now. Have there been any other projects you've been working on lately or areas you're focusing on? Well, since the book has been done, <laughs> that was kind of more focused on um, uh, um, adult relationships and introversion. I actually lately have been very interested in anxiety in teens and um, mostly middle school to, to high school age children and the, the severe anxiety that a lot of them are are experiencing and why um, that's kind of been my interest and I've been learning from a psychiatrist and pediatrician Dan Siegel he's a pretty amazing speaker writer many many books brainstorm the mindful therapist mindsight you know he's, I forget he's got like 10 books but um, anyway he talks about what the teenage brain how it how it develops and today what's what's going on with technology and the uber pressure to be successful and go to the right college and have this grade point average and and all these have this many friends on social media and be you know active there as well and it's just it's been very interesting so i've just been learning i have three teenagers at home my children so again <laughs> sort of the, um, you know, the obstacle is the way, <laughs> the things that you know, I'm dealing with in my own home. It's like, okay, how can I figure this out? How can I be more equipped to deal with my own children? But it's uh, very interesting. I feel like right now there's, it's a hard time to be a teenager. I, I watch my kids really strive to be impressive as far as grades they want perfect grades they want to get into the best schools they there's a lot more competition than collaboration and that's tough for for anyone there's not a no you don't feel that care and nurturance or, or things you, and my kids will say they really don't believe their teachers care that much about them the high school they have a giant giant school many like four thousand students so kind of feels like they're a number a lot of times and, and they don't get to know their teachers as well or even their other students. There's not a lot of time for being close to people. So I, they don't like school. My kids struggle, at least two of them. <laughs> my daughter still my daughter still likes school. She enjoys it. But I think that's because she has better relationships with her teachers and with her classmates. And she's the youngest too. So she hasn't got to the high, high pressure yet. Um, anyway, that's been my interest and my focus, just to try to learn how to abate that some for them. And that a lot of it is trying to be more responsive to them myself. So they feel like they have some grounding, some connection with others, uh, and then teach them that academics and their grades are not them. It's not who they are. And it's not the most important thing for their long-term well-being. Mm. So, yeah. What's your advice for our listeners? Gosh. Um, um, that conflict isn't the enemy. Um, there is the aim of conflict is progress and not winning so I used to be terrified of conflict. I didn't. I tried to avoid it at all costs to the point where I would just give up parts of myself to make things okay, make things peaceful. Yep, giving in and, and not really expressing what I needed or wanted. But real conflict can lead to real intimacy. So it needs to be hashed out. It needs to be talked through. And someone who's willing to work with you is you know the ultimate partner something that you should really keep in your life <laughs> what's your favorite book 
It's the Brenda Euland book, If You Want to Write, is the main title. And I think it's a book about art, independence, and spirit is the subtitle. But that's that's my favorite. I just you gained so much um, personal understanding from reading that book. <laughs> we are down to the end of our show here. Share with us some parting wisdom and the best way to contact you. Okay. Um, parting wisdom. <laughs> Don't... Try to be impressive, be loving. I think we spend a lot of time trying to be impressive, trying to be fun, entertaining, smart. Um, But if we can be loving and caring and open, that just makes life that much richer. I can be probably easiest to find me at brendanoles.com, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. And there's a contact form there, All lots of my writing, over 350 posts. Um, and then there's information about my coaching. I do both individual and couples coaching. So, Or I, you know, I empower people, but I also love working with anyone about their relationships, be it you know, family relationships or intimate relationships. So. Great. So that's brendanoles.com. I'll put this all in the show notes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brenda. Have a great day. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us today on Relationship Helpers. It is our hope that you gain some valuable information. For the show notes and more information on today's topic, please visit www.relationshiphelpers.net. Again, that is www.relationshiphelpers.net. If you enjoyed our show, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. If you had questions or concerns about our show, please let us know about this as well by going to our website, www.relationshiphelpers.net. Thanks again and have a blessed week. Note that accuracy and authority in regards to the subject matter covered today is not a replacement for professional care. Neither the host, the clinicians, or the guests are rendering clinical or other professional advice. Seek professional help if you need it.